Hi, I'm Dr. Pierce, and welcome to this video on eukaryotic transcription, or how does the information encoded in the DNA get converted into proteins that carry out cellular functions. Now, granted there are two parts to this process, transcription and translation, but the latter will be in a different video. In this video, I would like to discuss how DNA is converted into pre-mRNA and what happens to that pre-mRNA to turn it into the final mRNA product. So here's a small snapshot of what the process looks like in real time, courtesy of our good friends at the DNA Learning Center, which has some really cool videos. You can see the enzyme zipping down the, uh, the DNA strand, reading the code, and then producing a growing mRNA strand. So as I mentioned, the conversion of DNA sequence into protein requires both transcription and translation. And just like mitosis and meiosis and the Kelvin cycle and the Krebs cycle, these two are often mixed up, leading to disastrous results when you're trying to explain one, but end up writing about the other. So here's a brief analogy to help you consider the differences between the two. So imagine myself as a Canadian were to describe this picture. I might say something like this. She kissed him while on the dock, eh? Okay, that's a little stereotypical, but there you go. Um, now, if I were to write it such that a Brit would understand it a little bit better, I might write this. She snogged him well on the J, and I apologize for that accent as well. Now, note that it's the same language and the same alphabet, even though there are a few differences in the message that was transcribed. Now, if I were to do this again, but this time in Korean, I would get something like this. And, it, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Uh, in this case, the message needed to be translated since it was in a completely different language. And I thank my Korean students for doing this for me. So this is the same for the central dogma. RNA to D, uh, sorry, DNA to RNA is still in the language of nucleic acids, even though there are some slight differences, for example, the T's to the U's. But when converting this into a protein, it must be translated since the proteins are written in the language of amino acids. So it's important to keep these processes clear in your mind so that you don't write an amazing answer regarding the process of transcription when the question was actually about translation. So before we begin, we should take a look at the structure of a gene. So if you look at a double-stranded piece of DNA, somewhere along that point, there will be what's called a promoter, which signals the beginning of a gene and where transcription will actually start. Further down the DNA strand, there will be what's called a terminator. A terminator that will end transcription. Therefore, this section of the DNA is going to be the part of the DNA that's transcribed into an mRNA. Now, within that transcribed region, there's going to be both a start and a stop signal for translation. And this represents the area of the mRNA that will actually be converted into a protein during the process of trans, uh, translation. So the goal of transcription is simple. It is to produce a messenger, R, uh, messenger RNA that contains the encoded instructions to produce a specific protein. Transcription can be separated into three parts, initiation, elongation, and termination. So let's have a look at those and see how they work. So in initiation, RNA polymerase binds to the promoter and at that point, it causes a local disruption of the hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands in the area around the promoter, and that forms the transcription bubble. Now, once the transcription bubble is formed, the RNA polymerase can now begin to create a new mRNA strand using just one of the DNA strands as a template. So now, let's take a closer look at that transcription bubble and what's going on inside of it. So here we have a transcription bubble, and for the purposes of clarity, I haven't, I haven't included the RNA polymerase in this diagram. But note that the DNA strands are anti-parallel and that the open region contains the promoter. Now, initiation begins with RNA polymerase enzyme facilitating the binding of an RNA nucleotide to one of the two strands. Now, from this point on, the mRNA, uh, sorry, the RNA polymerase will add RNA nucleotides onto the open three prime end of the strand. So a bit of nomenclature here uh, at, the, at the end. The strand, the DNA strand that is copied is actually called the template strand since it is, well, it's the template which is read to, uh, to make the new RNA strand. 
The other DNA strand is called the coding strand because if you compare its sequence to the growing RNA molecule, which now holds the code to make the new protein, they are identical, except for the U's and the T's. Okay, so now that we have initiated transcription, how does it keep going? Well, the RNA polymerase now starts to move down the DNA strand and in doing so, opens up the DNA helix by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the two strands. But unlike DNA replication, where the two DNA strands continue to separate, here the DNA strands behind the RNA polymerase snap back together and in doing so, the RNA molecule that was held to the template strand by the hydrogen bonding in that spot is now displaced. But Note that the growing mRNA strand is still anchored to the template strand in the transcription bubble. Now, this continues. The RNA polymerase opening up the DNA strand as it moves along and adding on to the RNA strand, and then the DNA strands joining back together, displacing the, MR, uh, sorry, the mRNA molecule or the RNA molecule. Now, in other words, the transcription bubble simply moves down the length of the uh, gene as the RNA is produced until such time that the RNA comes to the terminator sequence. At this point, the enzyme stalls and this causes it to fall off the DNA and that releases the RNA product as the DNA helix snaps back together. So the RNA polymerase is now to free to go off and transcribe another gene and the other DNA and the original DNA molecule has actually been restored. So our product is now a pre mRNA molecule, at which point you say, wait, what? What do you mean by pre-mRNA molecule? Well, the RNA molecule is that's peeled off of a eukaryotic gene during transcription is not quite ready to be translated. In fact, a number of post-transcriptional modifications need to take place before it's ready to be translated. So to understand this better, let's go back to the structure of the gene, since I really didn't tell you the whole truth about it the first time. It turns out that the area between the promoter and the terminator is divided up in between alternating sections called exons and introns. So exons, here shown in blue, are parts of the DNA that actually code for the protein and therefore will be the areas that will be translated by the ribosomes. Introns, on the other hand, are sequences of DNA that do not code for protein and thus need to be removed from the pre-mRNA before the translation process. So, when the RNA polymerase transcribes a gene, it produces a pre-mRNA molecule that contains both exons and introns. It is now up to another set of cellular machinery to remove these introns, forming the final mRNA, uh, mRNA that contains the continuous code for the protein, and this process is called splicing. So, given the energy cost of transcribing these sequences and the effort required by a cell to cut them out, only to throw them away, a young Liam Neeson simply asks a valid question. Why do we have introns. It used to be thought that introns were simply junk DNA that served no purpose whatsoever, but research has proven this theory quite wrong. There's now DNA sequence evidence that shows that introns have been selected for throughout evolution. So what benefit could they possibly provide? Well, uh, the first thing is gene regulation. Sometimes introns have been shown to contain DNA regulatory, se regulatory sequences such as enhancers, which uh, have a positive effect on the transcription of the gene, as well as uh, silencers that control, um, that have a negative effect on the transcription of the gene. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, also, the introns themselves may actually contain other genes that are transcribed in the same or opposite direction. Recall that a gene is transcribed off of the template strand of a gene, but there could be a different gene that's encoded on the other strand as well. So that's the second thing. Uh, a third thing is that some introns have been shown to uh, play a key role in breaking down mRNA molecules. So once the mRNA is formed, one of the introns can actually play a role in binding to and destabilizing the mRNA. And that is uh, a way to contribute to the regulation of the protein production in the cell. And then finally, there's the presence of introns allow for 
alternative splicing. So in other words, a single gene can be used to make multiple proteins depending on which introns are being removed during the splicing process. So in that case, sometimes a DNA sequence can be an intron for one protein and an exon for a different one. So let's take a look at how this works. So imagine for a minute that this is our RNA sequence that's going to produce a protein. If the following two uh, sequences are introns and those are removed, you will produce a certain kind of message that leads to a different protein. However, the same mRNA could have different introns, which when removed give you a slightly different message and a slightly different final product. And again, this can happen in a number of different ways, producing a number of different products all from the same, uh, the same gene. And that is what alternative splicing can do for you. So how realistic is this anyways? Uh, well, it's been shown that humans have an estimated 20,000 genes and the average human gene has about eight introns. It's also been estimated that about 95% of those genes so, show some sort of alternative splicing capabilities. Now, you may have heard about the Human Genome Project, but scientists are currently working on a human proteome project, which aims to identify and catalog all the proteins that humans produce. Now, a draft of this, um, of this project estimated that there is about 30,000 proteins, although some current estimates figure that could go up to at least 50,000. So you need to stay tuned for that. The point is 20,000 genes is giving rise to a whole lot more than 20,000 proteins in human cells. After your mRNA is produced via the splicing mechanism, there are two other post-transcriptional modifications that take place. So here we have the mRNA with its five prime and three prime ends. The first modification is to take a GTP nucleotide and add it on backwards onto the five prime end of the mRNA, forming what is called a five prime cap. The second modification occurs at the three prime end, and that is when a different RNA polymerase adds between 100 and 250 uh, A nucleotides onto the three prime end of the mRNA. So for obvious reasons, this is called a poly A tail. So what are the modifications for? Well, the first thing we need to remember is that we are still camping out in the nucleus of the cell where transcription, splicing, and modification all occur. So the first role of the cap and the tail is to actually help the long mRNA strand make its way out of the nucleus through a nuclear pore and into the cytoplasm where the ribosomes are and translation will occur. And there is also new evidence to show that the five prime cap aids in ribosome binding. But lurking in the cytoplasm are enzymes that are looking to destroy the mRNA. So both modifications provide temporary protection from these enzymes and thus increase the stability of the mRNA so it can be translated into protein. So one, of example, uh, one example of one of these enzymes is something called an exonuclease that will degrade the mRNA from the three prime end. Now, as long as it's chewing on the poly A tail, the mRNA is unaffected. And this ultimately provides the cell with another level of control when it comes to producing the right amount of protein at the right time and in the right place. The longer the poly A tail, the longer time the mRNA will be around and thus the more protein that can be produced. So since once the exonuclease reaches the actual coding region of the mRNA and starts to degrade this, you can no longer make any more protein. Of course, if you needed more protein, you can always scrub back to the beginning of this video and start the whole process over again. Thanks for watching.